Welcome to the Informed Pregnancy and Parenting Podcast. I'm your host, Dr. Elliot Berlin, and co-hosting with me today is Kristen Polacy. She is a doula, new doula. Yes. She is just about to finish her chiropractic training. Soon, yes. And focusing very heavily on pregnancy and pediatric care. She's got a little toddler at home and a husband to deal with. So uh, I don't know how you guys do it. I would never... You told me that I should get a wife. Uh, everybody should get a wife. <laughs> everybody should. Even if you're married to a dude, you should still have a wife. <laughs> that's that's just my two cents. <laughs> I agree. Today we're talking about the path to midwifery. There's lots of different kinds of midwife, and um, w- some people go to nursing school first and then become midwives. They're certified nurse midwives. Uh, but there's another path. You can become a direct entry midwife or a professional midwife, which means you can go straight to midwifery school and do your training there. Our guest on the podcast today is Dr. Jennifer Angel. She is a chiropractor. She is a doula. And she is now a student midwife. Welcome to the podcast. Thank you for having me. I'm very excited to have you because, there, first of all, there's there's a lot of parallels in our lives. We both went to chiropractic school around the same time and then graduated and found ourselves in uh, knee-deep in bumps. Uh, but our way of sort of getting there was very different. And I want to talk about more about yours. Um, my understanding is that you kind of always were attracted to the world of, of pregnancy and birth. That's right. Um, I, I, I was, birth is in my soul, and I, I can't, I can't run away from it. And um, the pull toward mid- midwifery school started a long time ago. So, um, where did you grow up? I grew up in Minnesota. Minnesota. Yes. Why do I always feel like saying that every time somebody says Minnesota? Because so that's cool. the way we say it. You do. I'm can, from Minnesota. Minnesota. Right. Yeah, it is. And also, there's a weird Al Yankovic song. <laughs> do you know what it is? <laughs> No. It's called The Biggest Ball of Twine in Minnesota. I love him. I heard it's it so only funny. once, but I can't get it out of my head. And <laughs> now it will be there for the entire next hour. I have not heard of that. Cold in Minnesota. Very cold, and that's why I don't live there anymore. Okay. I love my family, but... Um, <laughs> they still there? They still they there? are. Um, okay. I was born and raised in Minnesota. I have a huge family. I have three brothers and three sisters. Wow. And um, I just have one brother that's out here in California and one brother that's in Toronto, but everybody else is still in Minnesota. Wow. wow. So I have aunts, uncles, cousins, grandparents, my mom and my dad, like everybody's still in Minnesota. Wow. But, um, I, I lived there for three decades, and one year I was and, – and you have to come from a cold state like that to understand that when you're shoveling, you're not just shoveling snow – you also have what's called an ice pick. Hmm. Have you ever heard of an ice pick? So like, like for break shovel- the deep yes. layers of ice underneath the snow from the or sidewalk within the sidewalk. Yeah, that goes to your front door. Like I don't think anybody really realizes that, or even you know, like what are the scrapers? You know, for the we windshield, windshield and that sort of thing. And people um, uh, work because I grew up in New York, which also gets snow and ice. Not as much, yeah, not yeah. nearly as much. Yeah. But, uh, like, some of our friends had the driveways that had heated yes. pipes going through it, yes. so it would melt all the snow. And you know what was a great present when I was in my early 20s? People would buy you a car starter for Christmas or for your birthday. A car starter? Oh, you, remote car remote, starter? Remote, yes. Yeah, so that when you're in the restaurant and you're finishing up with dessert and it's 30 below out, you click, click, and it starts your car. And then it's warm when you get out there. Ooh. And the same is opposite for, like, in, you know, when it's 100 really degrees. Hot. and it's, You leave the you know, the state bird is out, which is the mosquito, and it's hot and it's humid. <laughs> you know, so the car starter comes in handy for all seasons in Minnesota. But going back, I remember shoveling one particular nasty winter, and I'm like, what am I doing? And I really feel like intuitively I always knew that I would live in a warm state. And my brother had been living out here in L.A. for 14 years, and I was like, I'm coming out to visit, bro. And I bought a one-way plane ticket. And That's I quite a visit. <laughs> I didn't go back. Like, Are you still here? My little brother drove my car out like months later, and I had all my stuff shipped to me. I came out with a suitcase and my golf clubs. Wow. wow. Yeah. Welcome. So, and that How was long ago was that? Um, 11 years ago. Oh, wow. welcome aboard. Thank you. Yeah, you really can't go back after that. I can't. I can't. I'm, my heart is here. Where this did you go? Home. So you said from early on, birth is in your soul. Yes, it is. It is. It has been. I was. I really feel like I was born to attend births and be a, a birth provider. Um, 
I said I have three brothers and three sisters, and I grew up playing house and playing with my dolls. And um, us sisters would put our dolls inside our shirts, and we would birth our babies vaginally. And we would put our babies to our bare chest with our flat chest, and we would nurse our babies. I can't believe none of you had placenta previa. Oh, I know. Like, <laughs> but we handled the hemorrhages like no <laughs> Like, n- nobody bled out. It was yeah. amazing. Anybody do um, water birth with their baby doll? Gosh, I don't yeah. think that we knew about water birth yet. Yeah. <laughs> but, but like, as a, like, a child, even, I was drawn to to just this maternal pull toward babies and, and pregnancy and, and mothering, just mm. really mothering. And I remember going to the county fair. I, I know there's a county fair here, but in Minnesota, the county fairs are a big deal. And um, there'd be these tables that had like the models of conception and then the baby in you know the second month and the fifth month and the sixth month. And, that. and I was just like, in, just enamored At the with county it. fair? Yeah, at the county fair. I used to just sing you know? like squash. I know. <laughs> but I would be Apple like pie. riveted, <laughs> riveted on the growth of the baby in the womb and as my parents, a kid. my dad would be like, Jennifer, 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 get a, get away from there. And I was <laughs> like, but, but, you know, and it, and I just, you know, textbooks, anything I could get my hands on. And my, my stepmother ran a daycare. And so there were babies like I, I mean, and having four younger siblings, I was a mother. I was just Oh yeah. That's what I was going to ask you. Like where you fell yeah, in. I was third in line and then I had four after me. Four and, behind you. Um, and then with a da- oh, home so you're daycare. Like, wow. Like, a middle child in a large family. Yeah. I had a baby on each hip and I could, I could change a diaper and feed a baby and burp a baby all with like you know my, my pinkies like mm. it was so mm. natural to me and it was so easy for me and um yeah like I, I mean i can continue on with that like healthcare is something that i was thrust into unfortunately because my mother passed away when i was 4 years old oh i'm sorry um she died unexpectedly from a heart attack when you were four? And when I was four. So she had five wow. beautiful babies that she left behind. I say they're babies. My brother was eight. My sister was six. I was four. My little brother was two. I mean, I'm so sorry. My little sister was two, and my baby brother was six months old when my mother passed oh my away. Oh, wow. Yeah. And so unexpectedly and tragically, that obviously changed our lives and changed my family's dynamic and changed um, changed everything for me. Um, and, and out of something so tragic and unexpected and sad— um, I am where I am today because of that situation. How old was your mom? My mom was 34. Wow. Oh, my God. And she had no diagnosis of any heart disease and nothing. I mean, she had been under the care of doctors. She had given birth five to five beautiful children, completely natural. My dad always talked about my mom's pregnancies and my mom's deliveries. And they were beautiful and they were amazing and no complications. And so like just growing up with my dad's stories and my mother was also very descriptive with her birth stories and all of us had a baby book, which is really amazing. That's nice. And my mother wrote our birth story. And so I have my birth story in my mother's handwriting in my baby book, which is wow. in a cupboard in at my house. Like it's it goes with me forever. Um, so, you know, I just... Like birth wasn't something to fear. Like it was, it was in her writing how it just it was amazing. Like she was, I don't know why it comes back to the county fair all the time, but like when I was born, I was born in August, and they were at the county fair when my mom started having contractions, and she wrote about that in the book, you mm. know, and and it's just beautiful. That's really sweet. So, That's really nice. They were checking to see if there was a familial tendency for what my mother had. Um, she was diagnosed with heart arrhythmia and cardi- cardiomyopathy. Um, on her autopsy report, she had 90% occlusion of her coronary arteries. And um, Wow. Yeah, 34. it's at 34. It's, you know, looking back, you know, this was a long time ago. <laughs> um, and I don't think that they had, you know, as much advancement in medicine as they do today. But my, my 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 birth mother, my mother was always large for her. You know, in pictures I even see from when she was in second grade that she was like the largest child in the class. You know, in the class picture, and she was fed all the same things and was brought up the same way as her siblings. She was one of five, and none of her siblings were overweight. You know, um, my my father actually said to me that some of her pregnancies she actually lost weight. Hmm but had healthy pregnancies. So I decided that when I went off to college that I was going to go into medical research because I really wanted to save the world and I really wanted to do research on heart disease. And that was what I was going to do is I was going to save the world through medical research. And so I went to college and my undergraduate degree was chemistry. 
And my dad, I remember him even like, why are you doing chemistry? That was like your worst class in high school. And I was like, if you challenge me, I'm totally going to do it, right? Mm -hmm. And so I totally slayed my chemistry degree, right? But I was um, in my last year of college, and my best friend got hurt at work. She slipped on a wet floor, and she hurt her back. And so her employer said, oh, you need to go to a chiropractor. And she grew up with chiropractic. So that was no problem for her. She was like, okay, Jen, you're going to come with me. We're going to go to the chiropractor. I'm like, you're going to go where? I had never heard of a chiropractor. I didn't know what chiropractic was. So she pretty much drugged me with her. And it was it was crazy because I this totally dates me as well. But she opened the yellow pages. <laughs> we didn't have the internet. Well, I mean, we had no. the internet probably, but we didn't have cell phones or anything like that. It was but she different. opened the yellow pages and looked under chiropractors that are that had their advertisement. She was like, oh, I've seen that one on the main drag in town. That's where we're going. So we went to that chiropractor and it was the first time that I'd ever been in a chiropractic office. It's the first time that I'd ever seen a chiropractic adjustment. That doctor was amazing. He brought me back with her and I was sitting in the corner when he adjusted her and I was laughing so hard. <laughs> <laughs> I could not stop laughing. I mean, you know, the sounds that were being made and the, the positions he was putting her in. And even at that point, I was like, oh, my gosh, like, I could do that for the rest of my life. Um, but I saw her instantly get better. And so my my paradigm shifted instantly. Mm. And I went back and I talked with that chiropractor and I shadowed him. And then I went back to my hometown and there was a local chiropractor that was a family friend and I shadowed him. And it was so amazing. Like I saw him putting up x-rays and people asking for second opinions and people asking about supplements and diet and all these types of things. And I just, it just resonated with me. Like I was like, wow, this is something that I would love to pursue. And I actually went back to my um, counselor at college and I talked to him. I said, I really think that I'm um, interested in chiropractic school. And he just grabbed a book off the shelf, like like literally two feet away from him. And it was a list of all the chiropractic colleges in the United States. And he like kind of, you know, slid it across to me. And I picked it up. And I remember looking at Los Angeles College of Chiropractic. I think there was one of those at that time, wasn't there? <laughs> yes. <laughs> um, and I remember even getting like a... A DVD and like some materials from them and talking back with my guidance counselor again. And my guidance counselor, it's always interesting. I say that there's there's very key points in your life where somebody is very influential, you know, one way or the other, positive or negative. And, and I'm super thrilled that he pointed me in the direction toward and, and really um, encouraged me with my pursuit of chiropractic school. But one thing he said is that you're born and raised in Minnesota, so you need to go to school in Minnesota. Hmm. I'm like, what? Looking back, I'm like, because like here I am living thousands and thousands of miles away from my my original hometown and so eventually I did get out of Dodge but um, I did go to Northwestern College of Chiropractic and um, and that was where the biggest shift toward um, maternity care and midwifery and everything was was woken up in my soul and stirred up and forever. During chiropractic school? It was in chiropractic school yes. Well that's interesting because I mean in our chiropractic training. I went to Life University in Georgia. There's very little on, there's some on pediatrics, but very little on pregnancy and mm. and uh, birth. Wow. Did you have a lot of training or, or coursework on it? Well, my favorite classes were embryology. I thought that was fascinating. Oh, yeah, but obstetrics, embryology. <laughs> obstetrics was, was, that was probably the key class. And then pediatrics, of course. But, um, the our professor that taught obstetrics was just so much into well woman care and, mm. and when we did the labs and we did learn about you know breast exams or even paps and all that kind of stuff i mean like not like i choose to like that's like my passion is doing those types of things but but i don't know woman care just i was pulled toward that too um but in obstetrics in that class when we learned about normal birth i decided at that point in time when i was 20 years old not having a boyfriend no kids anywhere on my radar that i was going to birth my babies at home that I would really? hire a midwife like it was just so natural for me like it just it was a no-brainer and then 10 years later when I did have my first baby I had her at home and then eight and a half years after that I had my second baby and I had her at home too oh wow well, congrats so, and congrats thank you thank you um so after you finish I mean what else can you do with it? So you're in chiropractic school. You take this obstetrics class and embryology, and you're yes. excited about it because birth so is in your soul. Excited. Yes. And yes. you already make your future, future personal birth plans. But yes. what else can you do with that? I mean, as a chiropractor, there's not a whole lot of obstetric interplay. Exactly. So 
right after school, I enrolled in the ICPA program, so the International Chiropractic Pediatric Association, and I know that I needed to specialize in treating pregnant women and children, and I did that. And um, through one of the many continuing education classes that I took, there was one very prominent chiropractor who was lecturing, and she explained that she was also a birth doula. And I was like, a birth doula? What? <laughs> so that was the first time that I'd ever heard that the term. term yeah. So I graduated about 15 years ago. And so 14 years ago was my first, the first term doula was presented in front of me. And I was flabbergasted. I was like, are you, are you kidding me? I'm like, wait a minute, like you're a chiropractor, but you attend births. Mm-hmm. Oh my gosh, I've got to talk to you. So after the lecture, I talked to her. And I, like I said, I think it was actually in chiropractic school that when I was in my obstetrics class, if I had done things over, I most likely would have just went straight to midwifery, Hmm. you know? But I didn't know anything about midwives until I was deep in probably third trimester, you know, chiro school, and I had already put in how much time and effort and eight years of school. You know, you do four years of undergraduate, which was my chemistry degree, and then I'm in four years of a postgraduate program, and then I'm looking at possibly, like, becoming a midwife as well. But, um... Um, I talked to this particular chiropractor, and I I talked to her afterward, and I I learned a little bit more about her being a doula, and I said, gosh, you know what? I said, I really, 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 really would love to be a midwife. And I don't think she quite understood where I was coming from or what I was trying to say. It was because I knew that if I were to become a midwife, that I would have to do a full new training and that I would have to have another license. But she said, oh, sweetie, I'm so sorry, but you you can't be a midwife. She said, because... Under our license, we're not allowed to sever body tissues. We can't cut umbilical cords. We're not allowed to practice obstetrics. And so I just remember leaving that feeling just deflated. Yeah, I can like, I, feel I it. can't be a midwife. Like, and I just think it was just a miscommunication between the two of us. Mm-hmm. And so I just kind of pushed it away. Mm-hmm. And so I pursued my boutique practice. I would say I've had a boutique practice since I started practicing chiropractic. It's always been a specialized practice. Um, I see bumps every day, just like you. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, eight to 10 pregnant women coming in every day, you know, three to four infants, you know, some children. And it's been very um, empowering and it's been very validating. But what really gets me is is being present at birth, mm-hmm. you know. And so, f- so 15 years ago, I became a licensed chiropractor. 14 years ago, I did my birth doula training through DONA, which is um, one of the largest organizations that um, trains and certifies doulas, which you're do- DONA certified, mm-hmm. correct? I'm DONA trained. Oh, DONA trained. Okay. Yeah. I don't know if I'll ever send in my certification oh, packet. Oh, you didn't do the whole program. <laughs> well, I did it. It's <laughs> sitting kidding. on my desk. Yeah. I just, uh, yeah. I don't know, 100 births later, I, yeah. I'm so busy with everything else going on. You forgot on. to do your paperwork. You just need to send it in. No. you got to send it in. <laughs> yeah, I could send it in. Uh, yeah, so. I don't know. Yeah. So I sent it in, and I've been I've been certified since then. So, and I've attended over three hundred births. I don't even count anymore, um, either as a certified birth doula, as a midwife assistant. I did a lot of midwife assistant mm. um, births, and now as a student midwife. So, that's so exciting. Um, I mean, super uh, I just feel the look. My progression was very. There's a lot of parallels, but a lot of differences at the same time. I mean, shocking number of parallels. Uh, I always thought I grew up in a very medical environment, too, just a more Western approach to medicine. And um, I, I always thought, like, the best doctor in the world could figure out exactly how much antihistamine and how much pain reliever and, and put it all together and add a little blue dye and you have NyQuil, you know. <laughs> but And that's what I would do. I would be like, oh, how, which symptoms do you have? And I would just figure out exactly how to, how to just like you said, a pill for every oil. Yeah. And uh, I thought I was going to like go to, I, I was seven, I think, when I took a random, I stepped in on a CPR class. And I saw I saw what was happening. I was like, I gotta I wanna put my hands on people and help them. And uh then I just became first aid, responding to emergencies, lifeguard training and and before you know it, at seventeen I'm training to be an EMT and work in ambulances and right. I was gonna be the world's greatest surgeon or something surgeon. I didn't know what exactly. But then also my father died at a young age. He was uh, 48 and had a sudden heart attack one night, and he was gone. And it just made me take this big step back and and rethink my approach to healthcare. And um, so I sort of fell in love with chiropractic and massage together, went to school for both at the same time. 
And the shift into the obstetric world was a total slingshot that I was not expecting. It was just I, I kind of discovered a connection between certain types of back pain and infertility. And when I was pursuing that and trying to figure out the common source of both and how we can overcome it, uh, we started a program to help people naturally get their bodies in a more fertile place, natural fertility boosting program. And within a year, we had all these bumps in the office. And they said, I want to keep coming to you. Because remember, they came with back pain and infertility. So um, when you help them overcome the infertility and they still have some back pain to work through, they want to keep coming. And I just, I didn't know anything about it. Just our training in chiropractic school was so minimal about chiropractic for pregnancy. And so I looked around and I also went to the ICPA looking for answers and help and more training and guidance. And so I spoke to, on the phone to other chiropractors around the country who were doing prenatal care. And just to like not turn away my clients who wanted me to keep working with them. And at first it sort of felt like a driver's permit. I'm like, I can do chiropractic on you while you're pregnant safely. But then like the more you do it, you get good and confident and realize how much you could do for the pregnancy and for that mom during her pregnancy and birth and beyond with chiropractic and other other modalities like it. So and then my my I don't know, my I was breach. I was born breach as a kid. Um, and so somehow I ended up surrounded by Breach and, and making a Breach movie and other things like that. Uh, my mother, I don't think she wrote down my birth story like your mom did, but I, I, my kids, I don't write down their stories, but I do tell them at stand-up comedy shows, <laughs> which makes them a little <laughs> uncomfortable. <laughs> but in a lot of ways, we have this uh, similar background. And then, again, the natural progression was if we can help people – with the positioning of the baby during pregnancy, could we help people with positioning of the baby during birth when the baby is not breached, but let's say posterior or not in an ideal position to come down? That's how I, I got called to birth when I was at a pet store one Sunday trying very hard not to buy a pet uh. with my kids. And uh, <clears throat> a midwife called and said, well, this mom, is her baby's kind of stuck posterior. She's in a lot of intensity but in, in labor has stalled and isn't moving. Can you come help get this baby rotated? And I said, I have no idea, but I'm on my way to try. <laughs> and and she had a very great experience after a couple of uh, adjustments and some body work. Uh, and so word got out, and then more people were calling for birth. And I, I ended up at some births in a really uncomfortable situations where there was no doula, and the mom was sort of wanting more doula support. Looking at me, I'm like, I don't know. I just rub stuff and crack things. Uh, <laughs> So wow. that's when I did the donut training. And my wife is a doula, too. She did the donut training as well. We did it together. And, uh, you know, one thing led to another. I can see the the passion for, like, how it's just, like, not enough. You know, you want more fix and more fix and more fix. But on the other hand, there's so much responsibility for a midwife. Right. So much responsibility. I'm really grateful to you and the other the other men and women who become midwives and um, and and really offer take on that responsibility so that you yeah. can help women feel empowered and have the kind of birth experiences that they want to. But for me, I'm like at the yeah. end of the line um, on on how much I'm going to do. Well, I was wondering. I was wondering if you'd ever become a male midwife. <laughs> I mean, the thought had crossed my mind a couple of times. Yeah. But I just, I love what my role now that I play mm -hmm. during the pregnancy in the office, getting ready for birth, after birth, you know, helping her gain her strength back and and. Um, Re regain her pre-pregnancy, uh, everything. <laughs> and, so, oh, yeah. Sorry. It's so interesting for me to listen to the both of you talk because you're so seasoned and then in, like, the height of your career, and I'm just this, like, little peon <laughs> starting from the bottom. But I wish sometimes, especially being in school, that more people that worked with this population came into school because all we hear in school is that pregnancy is a contraindication, relatively. For chiropractic? For anything. Oh, like, right. But mostly for chiropractic, but anything that you try. Like, I remember being in um, a selective course for instrument-assisted soft tissue, and the teacher was like, well, you cannot be worked on, because mm -hmm. I was pregnant. Ah. And I was like, why not? I was like, I can do this to myself. Well, did you not see my presentation? It is a, it is a wow. relative contraindication. If something happens to you because 
we did this soft tissue work in your pregnancy, you will then say that it's because of what I did to you and you know, we can't have that liability. Right. There's liability concerns with everything in pregnancy. I was like, someone could fall, but but a normal person could do the same thing. Like, Yeah, but look what happens when you try to get a prenatal massage. True. It's like rubbing on suntan lotion. Yeah. It's, this is it's like generally a, very soft. A because we're afraid to use any pressure. We're afraid to touch the shoulder, touch the foot, touch the right. ankle, touch the yeah, hand. It, that's unfortunate that that's, But that's you like know, a the, core, part of your core curriculum is the, teaching you that that's not, not, not it. Yeah. Yeah, it's, it's unfortunate. About, you know, I just did a continuing ed. I was a presenter on um, chiropractic care and pregnancy. And one thing that I did is I pulled up the rules and regulations of the state of California. And there's a section that clearly states the chiropractors can treat and work, well, can work on pregnant women. It says you cannot practice obstetrics, but it clearly right. says, including yeah. pregnant women, that we can work on them and adjust them. And, and I really wish there was more confidence and <laughs> and, you know, it's interesting because when it comes to ultrasounds, the scope of practice for chiropractors says that we can use ultrasound both diagnostically and therapeutically, but then it also very clearly says, yes. but not to look at a baby. Yes, <laughs> yes. So. And I'm, I'm happy for that in our laws and our rules. Yeah. You know? It's sort of weird, though, if you're doing diagnostic ultrasound, you have to look away when you get near <laughs> Don't the baby. Look at the baby. <laughs> yeah, All baby. right. This is a fascinating discussion. Yeah. I uh, would like to learn more now about your midwifery studies, but we're going to take a quick break from a word from our sponsor, and we're going to come right back with Dr. Jennifer Angel. <laughs> if you're looking for the perfect baby or toddler gift, you've got to check out My First Year's online collection of clothing, toys, accessories, and more. Every adorable item can be personalized with the child's name for no additional cost. Get the perfect gift for any child in your life at My First Years, your go-to source for events and occasions such as baby showers, birthdays, and holidays. There are so many great options to choose from, you're definitely going to find a special gift that any child will love and cherish throughout their life. Every child should have something from My First Years in their wardrobe. Even the royal family, Prince George and Princess Charlotte, have My First Years in their closet. And now, for a limited time, you save 10% off your first order using promo code BERLIN, B-E-R-L-I-N, when you check out. Visit them at myfirstyears.com. That's myfirstyears using the number 1st.com. My First Years personalized gifts made with love, made simple. If you like our podcast, check out the Extraordinary Moms podcast, hosted by Jessica Dahlquist. It's a twice-weekly show that interviews different moms who share their motherhood journeys and the lessons they've learned along the way. She's interviewed everyone, from Joy Cho of Oh Joy about business and motherhood, Kelsey Nixon of the Food Network about the loss of her son and then her surrogacy experience, Danielle Busby from TLC's show Out Daughtered about her quintuplets. She covers every topic from special needs to mom guilt to adoption. Jessica wants other moms to see themselves in these stories and realize they are not alone in their motherhood struggles. You can listen on iTunes or other podcast apps or visit her website, ExtraordinaryMomsPodcast.com. Welcome back to the Informed Pregnancy and Parenting Podcast. I'm your host, Dr. Elliot Berlin, back with our co-host, Kristen. Welcome back. Thank you. And our guest, Dr. Jennifer Angel, who's on this wonderful journey from uh, giving birth uh, with, with her dolls at home <laughs> <laughs> to uh, the uh, county fair, uh, <laughs> all the way to a mishap into chiropractic school, falling in love with <laughs> obstetrics, becoming a doula, being told you couldn't be a midwife, and then saying... Boo to you. Exactly. And now you're a midwifery student. You mentioned in passing that you had two home births. Yes. Um, what were those experiences like given all the birth exposure you had yourself? My births were amazing. Um, I had attended over 100 births prior to the birth of my first daughter. Oh, wow. So you'd seen a lot. I had. And I thought I was a pretty rock and doula. But, man, after giving birth, like, <laughs> you come back and – it's just a whole different level of being a doula once you've actually been through birth, you know. Mm -hmm. So, so I apologize to those first hundred. <laughs> I'm just kidding. <laughs> I'm just kidding. Um, so I had established a 
pediatric and prenatal practice here in um, Orange County. Mm -hmm. And I had networked with, I was already so deeply involved in the birthing community. I knew so many of the midwives. I knew so many of the doulas. I knew the birth educators and and there was a, um, and so when I got pregnant, there was one midwife that who had regular, she would regularly call me to adjust women in labor, um, you know, if they were having, you know, a back labor with a posterior baby, if the baby was asynclitic, which means the baby was coming down a little bit crooked, or if there was just a stall or some other type of dystocia. I was, I joke sometimes that I was on speed dial with some of the local mm-hmm. midwives, you know, not just for adjusting women in labor, but also like after the baby was born, if the baby was having like a slower transition or was just, you know, a little grunty or just needed a little bit of assistance. And that, let me tell you, is so rewarding to be able to come in and adjust a baby that is literally Minutes, minutes old. old. Yeah, that's incredible. And makes such a change. And for that midwife to say, this baby would have been transferred had you not come. Mm-hmm. And so it's funny that you talked about being at the pet store. One time I was on my bike and I was on a <laughs> ride. So I'm in my kit, my spandex kit and my bike helmet. And a midwife called me and she's like, how quick can you get here? And I'm like, well, on my bike, got to get to my car <laughs> and then I got to get there. And so I walk in in full bike gear and I adjusted this baby and it was glorious like that baby and I say that baby had a headache like the frontal bone I would just gently do some craniosacral work and just release that frontal bone and that baby was as peaceful as an angel and I would let go of it and the baby would get all grunty uh, 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 and Mm. couldn't breathe softly and you know and gently the way that you know the baby should have been breathing so I held the bone again you know until the it resolved it was amazing and it's so beautiful and even one midwife, it was only maybe six months ago that she called me and I adjusted a baby. And she, she wrote it all up on Facebook in this beautiful blog. And, and she gave me so much credit. And I was like, no. I was like, you had it handled. Like, everything was beautiful and peaceful when I walked in. And that baby was doing doing well, you know? I mean, like, I, I don't know. I also do believe that the power of the chiropractic adjustment is absolutely profound and amazing. Mm-hmm. And, um, but I don't take credit. Like, I absolutely don't. Like, the body does the healing. You know, the power that sure. made the body heals the body. And, and I'm just a facilitator. And I'm so power, like, passionate about my births. Um, so it was, so when I did get pregnant, I just, I had had a pretty strong relationship with a local midwife. And so I just called her, or well, didn't call her up. I probably called the front desk or whatever and said, um, you know, I want to hire you for my birth, blah, blah, blah. So um, she also owned a local birth center. So, um, but I knew I was going to have a home birth. Like it was not even a question. Um, I'm just partial to home birth because of many, 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 many things. I can't even, I mean, do you have all night? No. <laughs> no, like we don't. So, but one thing is, is that after your baby is born and that baby is skin to skin with mom, the last thing that I want, like if you were to choose a birth center birth is like four hours after birth. You put that baby in a car seat and you have to drive home. And I'm like, no, that baby shouldn't even, number one, have clothes on. Like, that baby should be skin to skin, glued to mom's chest, you know. And, like, I t- so that's why also, like, I, I love home birth so much. And, uh, and birth centers are right for many people. So I'm not trying to, you know, say that it's a bad choice whatsoever. The, the most amazing thing about living in the United States is that you have options. You can do Lots hospital birth, choices, birth yeah. center birth, out of hospital birth, home birth, whatever. And I... Also, in my doula training, I've had such a journey and such a growth, you know, in in when I first became a doula, having my own biases and my own preferences and my own, like, deep-seated philosophies and, and, and getting almost emotionally invested in choices that would not be mine and not understanding, you know? So I've had to meet women where they are and, and totally support their choices and, and, and support them. Like, if they're well-informed— it's their, it's their body, it's their baby, it's their birth. And so I've had uh, to really work on that and work on, um, in my midwifery training in school, we work on that. Um, and also through a, do- uh, there was a doula certification. I not only did Dona, but I also did the stillbirth day doula. It's a birth and bereavement doula training. And that training, that doula program was so profound. <laughs> like it challenges you to, to explore, uh, you know, so many situations in life with, with expanding your family and with having babies and all of that, places I didn't want to go. And it really challenged me to, to look at that, you know, and, and no, I've never experienced pregnancy loss, but I knew that I needed to learn how to help families that do. And so that was a, just a beautiful journey that itself. So anyways, going back to my birth, I had a 30 hour labor and delivery with my first. Um, there were some challenges to overcome during the labor. My midwife did at, at one point in time um, want to transfer me to the hospital. And I was basically like, um, no, 
it's not going to happen. Um, you know, you're going to take me kicking and screaming to the hospital. I knew that everything was okay. I mean, I had enough. But there was something that she was just a little bit concerned about with the length of the labor and my water had been broken and just just some things like that. And so we had to compromise. We came to a compromise. And, and then she, she really dug her heels in. And I, I really I give her so much credit because she pulled out all the stops. She knew how serious I was, that I wanted to birth the way that I'd planned. And so we had a chiropractic come to mass and adjust me in the middle of my labor. And she did say that had it not been for that chiropractic adjustment. And how profound is that? And like, Mm -hmm. do I pull these things in or what is the universe trying to tell me? But I was four centimeters after 24 hours of labor. And like, I don't know, it was probably four hours after that that the chiropractor came and adjusted me. And then immediately after that adjustment, she checked me and I was seven. And so she said that there was, she really believes that it was a chiropractic adjustment that allowed me to continue to progress and have my baby. Mm. My baby was posterior and then the Uh, baby shifted, which is amazing. Um, I did have an acupuncturist came to the house as well. So I had the treatment and I was drinking castor oil. They were giving me herbs and I was was doing everything. And even though it was a long labor and delivery, it was beautiful. It was, I never felt like I, was I, my coping was fantastic. My doula was everything to me. We walked and we were in the tub in and out so many times. And, and I just, I just, she slid out into the water and into my arms and it was amazing and it was beautiful. And I, you know, I just, I look back on it, on it so fondly, so mm. fondly, so beautiful and, and amazing. And one thing that like, I, I know that you've said like you've you've recognized where you where you stop like with your journey through helping mothers with pregnancy and and you know bringing having healthier mothers and healthier families and healthier babies and healthier outcomes right by what you do right yeah. and that's what like that that's my passion and that's my journey is like I am so it's so hard for me to accept the United States statistics on maternal and health and infant health and i just like it's my it's my passion and my drive to have healthier babies healthier mothers and healthier outcomes you know and i'm going to start with it being my own clients and my own families but i I hope to hopefully have a more more vast and far-reaching impact i don't know how that will that will happen but um so one of the things is that there's so much fear involved with birth in our culture and so many women that don't even want to try or attempt a natural birth they're just so scared and I want every woman to have the opportunity to try. Mm-hmm. Just give it a try. And in my birth classes, I talk about the oxytocin. And oxytocin bliss after birth is so incredibly ridiculous that the oxytocin bliss after the birth of my first child was so huge and so emanating from every pore of my body that in the days right after having my baby and that baby is on my breast and I had my aunt with me. I know that I didn't have a husband, but that didn't even matter. I had such good support and I had girlfriends and I had my doula and I just had so much love that I was like, I have got to write a letter to the president of the United States about my midwife. My (laughs) midwife was the most glorious thing. I couldn't have had this baby without her. Hmm. And like, a couple days later, the oxytocin is coming down a little <laughs> bit. And I'm like, oh, my gosh, that's ridiculous. The president? Okay, fine. I'm, I'm going to be realistic here. The governor. <laughs> the governor of the state of California needs to put a gold seal on a certificate for my midwife. And, of course, the week goes by after that, and I'm like, okay, maybe the mayor. I mean, seriously, that's exactly what happened in my mm, brain. And I know, I see that in mothers that birth naturally and they're holding their babies and the oxytocin that bonds those babies and those those families together and the dad and and I'm drunk with it. Like as a birth worker, I leave yeah. those births and the sky is more blue and the grass is more green and the birds sing more beautifully. And it's that which drives me. Like, I just, I'm, I can't get enough of it. Your path is direct entry midwifery, right? Yes. Certified professional midwifery. Yes. What is the program like and how, where are you in the program? So that's a good question um, because I think it's very valid and very important. So uh, anybody who's being called knows that there's this path, which is a direct entry midwife. So after the birth of my first daughter, and I'm so ingrained and involved in the birth community, I my doula, like I said, started midwifery school. She was actually in midwifery school when I had my baby. So she was like in her second year or something. And so then she had her best friend went to uh, midwifery school just a couple years after that. And so there was like a group of my friends that went and they were like, you got to come with us. 
And I'm like, I can't. I'm a new mom and I want to practice and I'm single, a single mom, like working mom. Like I just had too much. And so then a few years would go by and then a few more of my birth friends, like a doula or a childbirth educator, and they enrolled in midway free school. And I was like, I think every time a bit of my heart just broke more and more because I'm like, I know I need to do it. I need to do it. And finally I recognized there's not the right time to have a baby, not the right time to buy a house, not the right time to go to school. You know, you just have to do it. With direct entry midwife, midwifery school, there's a couple of different things you can do. So you can actually go to a school that is like, you know, a brick and mortar school. Mm-hmm. Like you can go on campus, even though midwifery schools are probably a small, like the one in Florida was a school which was in a birth center. Mm-hmm. And so I actually went there with some classmates and we were doing classes there. Um, here in California, there's only one accredited school and it's in San Diego. And so um, they meet, I believe, once a week actually at the school on Fridays. And I haven't been to Nizoni. That's called Nizoni um, Midwifery School. And so most of the birth workers and midwives in this area have gone to Nizoni. But um, in California, if you look on the midwifery board licensure, there's about 10 schools listed that are accredited schools across the country that the California state board recognizes as accredited schools. And so some are distance learning programs. And so when I was looking at what school, when I did move back here to California, I was looking at possibly doing Nizoni, but I also was a mom and I also had a practice and was working. And so I was like, gosh, I just don't see myself dry. And I I have an aunt and uncle that live in San Diego. I do not I don't visit them very much because there's one way down and one way back. And I do not like that drive. And I just could not see myself driving that once a week for three years. So I explored the other options. And um, I decided to enroll in what's called National Midwifery Institute. It's actually out of Vermont. And Hmm. it's a distance learning program. Okay. So Uh, your training is, when you say distance, is it online? Is it Okay. Yeah. So it's all online. Um, I do... Um, All of the coursework is available online, and so I'll – like, there are modules that we do, and I download the modules, and then I I have all my textbooks. I probably have, you know, 30 midwifery textbooks all over my desk, and, you know, the modules vary, many different topics. Um, Do you do it at your own pace? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So with um, National Midwifery Institute, it is self-paced and self-driven, and I work great that way. Like, Mm -hmm. I am super disciplined, and I I can can do that. So other people need a more rigid, structured program. Um, But the nice thing about – um, National Midwifery Institute is that there are deadlines and minimum requirements. So I think some of the mid- minimum requirements is that you could take 10 years to do the whole program, program if you really wanted to. But I knew that I wanted to be a midwife as soon as possible. And lo and behold, what happens when anybody enrolls in midwifery school? Well, oops, they get pregnant. Oh, <laughs> so you got pregnant. <laughs> I did. I, so when I moved back to California, um, it's it's a really – ironic story is that I'd gone out to Florida to pursue a relationship which didn't work out and I come back to California and 10 days after I stepped foot back on California soil I met my now husband and oh. um, we it like it was perfect and right and so we have a baby now and she's amazing so right. I had a home birth with her but um, having a baby in the middle of midwifery school definitely sent Slows me back just down, a, a yeah. little bit so, but once you finish all those modules yes. right so then what else is involved in the training right so then you have an apprenticeship so I have a preceptor, I mean, much like chiropractic school, that we um, have internships and there's a preceptor. Um, I have a local midwife that I'm I'm, a, I'm her student. And so today I was at her office and she had – I'm not doing her whole day. She's usually there from like 9 till 5 or 6. And I, I usually come in about 1 and stay till 5 or 6. So you do prenatals and, yeah. with her? Yeah. So I was there doing prenatals with her today. I was listening to heartbeats and I was feeling bellies. And, and it's amazing because I get to because I am fully enrolled in an accredited school and I have a preceptor. Um, I'm not doing that under a chiropractic license by any means. Right. Um, but yeah, I mean, like it's it's so awesome. Like I'm in my element. Like I was driving afterward, and I'm like, that was such a good day. And, and then like, you also attend births. With I her? do. So, yes. So I'm on call. Um, she has like a senior student who is doing most of the births. She's in what's called her um, primaries. Mm-hmm. So when you do your primaries, you're pretty much doing everything. Like you're catching the baby. You're you're, you know, you know, delivering the placenta. You are doing any sutures and that sort of thing. So I'm still in my assist births. So there's a certain – so – sorry, I'll back up just a little bit. So she has basically like three students right now. One is 
Um, first year, second year, and then the third year. So the first year, you're pretty much doing observations. So you have to do 10 observations. And then the next year, you have about 10 assist births. I meant 20. I'm so sorry. So for this is for my school, uh, 20 assist births. And then you have 25 primary births. Okay. And so so in observations, in you're mostly watching. Yeah. And then yeah, just watching. In assist, what's the difference between an assist birth and And the primary? primary? Yeah. So, yeah, the assist birth is like handing, you know, the – the chucks pads or, um, you know, grabbing the meds or drawing up, you know, like the possibly the vitamin K if the baby's going to have vitamin K or, you know, just I and I'm also like I'll get there and I'll, I'll help set up. And so I'll help blow up a birthing tub or I'll fill it with water and we'll get like the um, the padsicles ready with the witch hazel and that sort of thing. So as an assist Student, I'm doing a lot of the setup and I'm doing a lot of the breakdown, and so I, I'm I'm really good at cleaning up right now, which is great, which <laughs> yeah. is great. And I know I need to learn how That's to do that. That's a really important thing because sometimes people don't want to have a home birth. I know. If their house is not going to be the yeah. way it was before the birth, it's sort of like why well, you want to eat out in a restaurant. Right. It's crazy. Like my midwife <laughs> calls her like other like we we refer to ourselves as the birth ninjas. Like we go in, like your house is your house and all of a sudden zoom, it's like a maternity ward and then zoom, we it's like leave. Yeah. And there's two bags, one's laundry and one's garbage. And, and we're like it. and that's... then you have this beautiful baby and you're just it's amazing. <laughs> so next year you do primary. Yeah, I'll probably move start I have 10 more assist births and then I'll start my primaries. And so primaries How many primaries do you do? Fun. I have to do 25. 25. Mm-hmm. And yeah. um, is there a certain number of hours? Some schools have hours. This one doesn't. It My old school did, number. and so I was accumulating hours, but it, now I don't need to anymore. Wow. And believe me, I've, I'm definitely putting in the hours. And then there's tests. Yes. There is the NARM exam, which is the National Association of Registered Midwives. And so there is a, it's basically a national board exam. So different states have different licensing laws. And in the state of California, to be a licensed midwife, you are licensed by the Medical Board of California. You do have to pass the NARM exam first. And you also have to have graduated from an accredited school. And then you can get your shingle. You can get your license. <laughs> add so, to your sh- add list to of shingles. Shingle, yeah. yeah. So I'm wow. super excited. Wow. It's it so looks exciting. like you're giving Chris some ideas here. Mm, I don't know. <laughs> no? I don't know. No. Not yet. You 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 don't have the calling. I do not. Yeah. I don't think I do not have the calling. I think I'm more called to helping after. You know, I think because I find that that first year, yeah, that first year of life is so hard. Yeah. So um, hard. and I think that that is more like I think lactation consultant maybe. Ooh, yeah. Um, since I haven't found in my area where I live that there aren't as many helpful ones that I found. That mm-hmm. would be amazing. Um. And so I think that's where I'm more called to, not necessarily the... Um, I think that's an area that's critically important to have somebody, not just someone who has the technical skills, yeah, but the people skills to really make someone feel supported. Yes. You know, no matter, again, almost like do the work. It's sort of like, it's not your... It's not your mission, your job to point them in one birth path or another based on your agenda. It's right. about helping you... Helping them explore their options, figure out what they want to do, and then helping realize as close to that um, birth plan as possible, as their birth intention as possible. But yeah. I think for breastfeeding, it's the same thing. You you come in like so non judgmental and so warm and yeah. big hearted that whatever happens, you know, you'll need the technical skills too. But yeah. whatever happens, they're going to feel at least really, they can try. Yeah, it's just really supported and, and like they gave whatever they wanted to try their best effort. Yeah, so exactly. That's really cool. All right. Well, this is fascinating. I yeah. I think that a lot of people um, get exposed to birth and get the bug. Mm-hmm. Um, exposed in lots of different ways. Sometimes, uh, you know, no intention to ever support women in labor in the way a midwife does. And they get excited about it but don't know really what's involved. And right. I'm really thrilled to see so many more people from the birth community taking the next step and becoming midwives. Our missions are very similar in terms of educating and informing and empowering uh, women and their partners about their choices and being supported in their choices. And, you know, I I give you a lot of credit for, for with all that you're juggling already, <laughs> taking on this, this uh, all the training that you have to do. I mean, 
it's you you could do the didactic part at your own pace to a degree but now that you're doing practicals it's just you never know when or for how long and ultimately once you hang your shingle it's the same thing but all the responsibility is now on you and it's it's heavy like you said you really need to be called into that profession and like you said there are so many people that like through their own birth because it was glorious and amazing and they want to help others with that. Or maybe their first birth didn't go quite according to plan. Yeah, and both. they really want to not only their own redemption, but to help other women and prevent other women from having the same possible not so ideal experience. But you can see that there are some that are, the ones that are called are the ones that stay. And other people will get into the birthing field and, and two to three years into it, they're like, hmm. You know, and then they'll phase out, yeah. you know. And I also appreciate shoes. you saying, no, I don't think that it's really for me. And another thing is like with home birth is you can never talk somebody into a home birth. Mm-hmm. They have to demand a home birth. Like they are so convinced that that's what's right for them. And that's one thing I love about my preceptor. She is the most beautiful and amazing midwife. I mean, she's – I don't even know what realm she comes from. <laughs> I mean, I just want to be – tenth like her because she's so amazing and I'm so happy that I'm working with her. Um, But she says that when, um, you know, prospective clients come to her, she has them tell her why they're a good candidate for home birth, you know, Mm, and and she will, she will never talk somebody into home birth. If they're kind of on the fence, they have to, you know, really convince her that that that's what's right for them. Reminds me of uh, Dr. Wu. I don't know if you knew him before he retired, but uh, he was in his 80s when he just recently retired from OB practice and he had done 20,000 births and he still delivered breech babies vaginally right up until the end. He had done 500 or so vaginal breech births. But people used to go to him and expect him to talk them into it. Like, hi, I'm a breach and I want to have a vaginal birth. Tell me all the reasons why I should do it. And it was the total opposite. Right. He w- wanted them to right. say, this is my conviction and this it. is why I want to do it. Exactly. Absolutely. And then he would support that choice. And I feel that's the way it is with natural birth, too. In general. And I'm sure you've seen it when someone's like, oh, I'm just going to give it a try. Right. I'm like, Sure. I, know, I know radio can't see my face. Yeah, but yeah. they can feel <laughs> but, your expression. Um, That's sort of something like, I'm going to just see committed. if I can hike and, up Mount Everest. And yeah, exactly. I mean, you have to but be I'm committed. But I'm not going to train for that. <laughs> That's right. No training. <laughs> and also, they have to be fluid and flexible and realistic and rational and know that birth doesn't always go according to plan and that sort of thing. But, Yeah. Well, you're very dynamic and inspirational to me. Oh, well, thank you. And um, I think our listeners will benefit a lot from what you've shared. Thank you so much for thank joining you. us. Thank you for and having me. Kristen, thanks always for being here. Thanks to the both of you. I feel very excited since <laughs> this is what I'd like to do. And I also have a, a pretty awesome preceptor myself. I, gotta awesome. meet, I would love to meet them. Uh, <laughs> you're sitting right next All to right. me. All right. <laughs> <laughs> Um, That's great. Yeah, I mean, I did think that thought crossed my mind when we sat down. You're about to finish your chiropractic training. You're already uh, trained as a doula and just yeah. so on the path. And um, and I follow know. you around. And you do follow me around. <laughs> There's not too many chiropractors who even work with pregnancy. So right, uh, right here, this is a rare group. Yeah. Uh, at home, thanks for listening to the Informed Pregnancy and Parenting Podcast. Be sure to share us with your friends. If you like what you heard, leave a comment, especially on iTunes. Somehow that means a lot to us. And access our blog documentaries, our YouTube series, The Real Midwives of Los Angeles, which will soon be uh, Dr. Jennifer Angel, (laughs) and our other pregnancy and parenting resources at informedpregnancy.com.